way, I came here when I for grade uh, for in, from uh, grade uh, from nineteen twenty. Oh, she was born eight. in nineteen fifteen, and when nineteen twenty yeah, was right. she started school when you were five. That's, yeah. Did you stay here for your whole uh, elementary years? Yeah. I went right through to grade eight. To grade public eight. school oh. at Orange Street School. Did it go to to grade eight at that time? Yes. Yeah. What are some of the first things that come to mind when you think of your time here at Ord? Well, <laughs> what do you remember? We, yeah, there was a, a different playground for the boys and a different for the girls, you see? And then on the very top, there was a, for people from all over the different schools who had to be in a special class because of their health. And that was at the very top. Yeah, I think it was called Fresh Air. Fresh Air, or whatever. Yeah. What was the cultural makeup of the students here at Ord at the time? That means where, where did most of the kids, what was their background? Well, they were uh, every background. It didn't matter whether you were English, Jewish. But what were most of them? Like? <laughs> Do you think most of them were Jewish? Well, Jewish? Jewish, yeah. Because yeah. this is where we live. <laughs> where, where most of the Jewish people immigrated and lived down here and worked for them. So and we like, say, Macaulay, like this area? Jew yeah. when it was the holidays, we didn't come to school. They knew we were Jewish. We stayed home. Okay. So it's almost like the whole school. It was school. the high holidays, you know. Like the whole school, like most of the kids in the school wouldn't come if it was a Jewish holiday? That's yeah. Right. Right, Mom? They wouldn't come if it was a Jewish holiday. Most of the kids wouldn't come to school, yeah. right? Tell them about what they, the girls, about the girls with gym that there was, you told me, there was no, no gym classes for no, the girls, we right? never had a gym class. Yeah. The only thing is, is when you went out to, in the playground, that's when the, that was our gym class. <laughs> Whatever we played. That's all. But the boys did have a phys ed class? No, they they had separate and we had yeah, separate. Yeah, but did the boys have a gym class, Mommy? No. Nobody no. had gym classes, just no. recess, you played, and that was it That's separate. It. The boys Except, and the girls. There wasn't such a thing as a gym class. Except that my aunt, my mother's older sister, um, was, my, I'm just my, reading her notes. Reading the notes I got from my cousin. She was the captain of the dumbbell team, whatever, whatever that is, it's probably weights or something, mm -hmm. at Ord. And I do recall my mom and her sisters talking about volleyball. You played volleyball? Yeah. yeah. So if there wasn't a gym class, they had like sort of, they had teams. And I guess people would. Do you remember what like teams there was? Like what sports they well, played? Well, my mom said volleyball. For well, the women, there probably was wasn't called. that. And much. my aunt said dumbbell team, which I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> what that we don't is. know what that is. We don't know what that is. A dumbbell is like lifting stuff. Yeah. yeah. But I think that's what they, uh, when there was a parade, the dumbbell. Oh, oh. it's not a bad idea. It's, it's like majorettes. <laughs> you know what drum majorettes are? You know, when they're twirling. Yeah. yeah. That was probably yeah. another situation. Along a uh, university. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I... Do you want me to tell you what my cousin? She also he also said that my mom's sister all her life had wonderful penmanship and spelling, and she and she worked she was she worked uh, all to well into her seventies as a bookkeeper, and she said that the reason that she had such wonderful spelling and penmanship uh, was because of what she had learned at Ord Street School. We're really focused. On what was the community around the school like? You talked a bit about some of the um, businesses that were around and where you lived. Well, Baldwin Street was full of businesses, huh. and it was mostly Jewish people, okay. like the butcher, the baker, the, mm. <laughs> and the uh, you name them. It was all around Baldwin Street, from McCall mm. to uh, Beverly. Okay. Yeah. And you but, lived in that exact area, you were saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah because uh, we had a grocery store. 
Oh. And on top, my father had built it out, mm -hmm. and we had tenants. Okay. And they all it was there three. Too. It was three stories high. And he also at night went to bake, but my mother looked after the store. Do you know if that actual building is still yes, there? Yes, it is. Yeah, that's, that's the same the building. building. That's exactly the same building. But, and it was the same building until, because I've worked at PM Princess Margaret now for over 30 years. The building was the same until probably about, I'd say four, six, or, five about years. four or five years ago. And they took the building and they basically renovated it. But the the, the shape, the bones, are the the bones of it, because we took my mom there for my, Bobby and Marty took my other for sister. Her 90th. For her 90th birthday, took her there for lunch. And, and I yeah. went in and I told the fellow that I lived here. And he gave me a drink free. <laughs> what a sport, eh? Yeah. yeah. I'll never well, forget, he gave me a drink free. <laughs> where the restaurant is was the grocery, the store, grocery store. And they lived floor. behind yeah. it and upstairs. And where there was, was now a garage was actually a stable. And all along Baldwin Street on the north and south sides were various businesses, but people lived with the business. Yeah, they usually lived upstairs Stairs, from their business, business or behind. Mm -hmm. They didn't have separate homes. Sure, when the, war, uh, when the war broke out and then it, it, uh, my, it stopped, you know, I forget how many years, my mother put out a flag. Yeah, we started order in 1926, okay. and I left in 1928. Okay. So tell us your first day experience. Okay. I couldn't speak a word of English, or understand a word of English. I came from Poland, and uh, I was taking in t taken into the room. My aunt brought me here to... In register me. We lived right across, around the corner on McCall Street here. And uh, she had to tell the principal, who was Dr. McDonald at the time. And he was a great big burly man and he frightened me because he had, he was very tall and very big man, you know. And uh, he had dark, dark curly hair, very dark, and he wore great big rimmed glasses and his eyebrows were so thick they almost touched his glasses, the rims of his glasses. So I was frightened just looking at him. And um, I was taken to the room and her name, my teacher's name was Miss Monroe. She was a very stern looking woman and I, at that time, she was to me, she could have been maybe 40 years old or 35, but she looked very old to me at the time. Did you know that the teachers, women teachers at the time, were not allowed to be married? They, if they were married, they couldn't be a teacher, the ladies. Hmm. See, things, that, things have changed now. So, okay. <clears throat> anyway, we got to Miss Monroe's room and my aunt had to interpret and tell her my name. I wouldn't speak my name. I knew my name was Rose because she told me it was going to be changed from my Rivi was my Hebrew name. And she, and she changed our names, all of us, my sisters. So I became Rosie. Not Rose, but Rosie. <laughs> Didn't like that. Anyway, the teacher took me down to the row the last row in the class, and the third row from the window. I remember everything very vividly. And then she went back to her chair up at the front of the class and began to speak to the children. And all of a sudden, and I'm sitting quietly, and suddenly everybody did this. So being a very obedient child, I was raised very to be, children should be seen and not heard, was the order of the day. And so we weren't allowed to ask questions that might have <laughs> bothered someone. But anyway, uh, because I saw them waving around, I did the same thing. I thought I was supposed to do that. Well, I could see a surprised look on the teacher's face, but uh, 
then suddenly, and the teacher, I guess, spoke to me, but I didn't understand. So she came marching down to my seat where I sat, and, uh, uh, and all the children turned around and started to laugh. And I could tell that they were not laughing for joy, but laughing at me. And I felt very uncomfortable. The teacher grabbed my hand and practically dragged me up to the front of the class. She got her chair, sat down, and took forced me on her lap, turned me on her lap, and lifted up my clothes and spanked me in front of the class. They could see my bare skin, and that was so humiliating. I thought I, wa I wanted to die. I was so humiliated. I was, felt like I was treated like a baby, and I didn't know why she was doing this terrible spanking. When she got finished, I ran out of the class with my head down to my knees, and this was January, uh, the twenty, the the, six, the what day was the the eleventh of January. I ran out of the room without my winter clothes or anything, and rushed all the way home. That was my first day at school. So, how what old were you? you? Yeah. yeah. How old were you on your first day of school? How old were you on your first day of school? I was um, exactly seven years old when I came here. Oh. See, and so they started me in grade one, and uh, I was, so there's a, I have to tell you the rest of it. I wouldn't go back to school because of the humiliation. So uh, it got around, and there was a little girl there in the class, her name was Toby Silver. She was told to bring my clothes back to me. And she told her mother what happened. And uh, they were very lovely people, and her mother was very annoyed, very fine lady. She heard what happened, and she came to visit me and insisted that she'll take me back to school to the principal and uh, report this teacher, but she did. So, and I wouldn't go back to school. I just couldn't face the children. So, uh, she said, you want to learn to speak English? You want to learn and, and, and be able to speak the language and get along? You have to have an education. She, and she was, spoke to me so beautifully. I was so impressed with her kindness. And I could tell that she was such a fine lady that I, she says, I'll make everything okay, you'll see, you, you'll want to go back to school. So she took me back to the principal, and um, she explained to him what happened. And uh, he said, this will never happen in my school again. He was very shocked, and he was very kind. The first, first time I saw him, I, I was frightened of him, but here was so nice and gentle and um, took me around and then they hugged me and he says, we're going to go down. The teacher's going to apologize to you and apologize to the class. And um, the teacher was, she did all that. She apologized to me. She apologized to the class. And um, then the, she, she was very upset that she did this. I could tell she was almost she was about to cry. She said that she would do anything to undo what she did. If I would come every day, like at recess time, to her class privately, she would teach me to speak English and also give her 15 minutes of my lunch hour, and she would teach me still fifth, every day for the rest of the term. I, so when they explained to me what she was going to do, I was happy to go back to the class. I, could, I felt sorry for her as badly as I felt about myself. Anyway, I, I passed number one in class in six months. I learned to speak English fluently without a trace of an accent, thanks to Miss Monroe for doing this. 
So when it started off, a terrible, terrible situation for me. And then uh, during the school time, I loved sports. I became the captain of the volleyball team. And we played all year against other schools, and then we won the finals, and we were due to we were due to play for the finals. And Dr. McDonald, the principal, I became his favorite child. <laughs> the classes were quite large. I remember something that numbers like 40, 45 children in the class. The teachers were mostly female, uh, mostly not married, and uh, mostly in their late 40s and 50s. There were some, uh, the principal uh, was a, a Dr. McIntosh, the assistant principal was a Mr. Hart. Uh, we also had a, a manual training class which uh, taught the children, I think it was mainly for boys, it taught the children how to use uh, uh, some of their mechanical skills. For the, her for the girls, they had classes in the household science which would involve uh, some work around the house, cooking perhaps, setting up a table for dinner. But by and large, the teachers were mostly female. I don't think the, uh, the enrollment, I think there's somewhere between four and 500 children. It was quite a, a large school time. Everybody mixed, it didn't matter, black, white, pink, green, doesn't matter, everybody played together. Parents uh, got along well. There it's, was uh, no, no animosity, no, no infighting. Uh, we worked along very well. The blacks were our friends, the Chinese were our friends, the Finns were our friends. So there was no, uh, no sort of infighting. I, I think one of the main reasons possibly was everybody was poor. Uh, they, they were all working class people. I remember my dad was a farmer. And he told me he used to make about seven, ten dollars a week, and that was pretty good. Uh, a lot of the others were working in factories and making five dollars. So. In 1936, when I arrived at the school uh, in January after the Christmas break, uh, I, uh, our family had immigrated into the country from Poland, and we settled in this area, and. Uh, but uh, we had no prior knowledge of English. All we spoke was Yiddish and Polish. Uh, but uh, in those years, of course, there were no uh, classes in the ESL, extra, extra lessons for immigrants, for non-English speaking people. And uh, basically, we learned in the schoolyard for him to play with other children. The teachers, uh, they taught in English, they didn't know any other language. Do you remember not understanding what of the teachers course. were saying? Of course. But there were, but there were enough uh, children in the class who uh, spoke Yiddish and maybe some Polish and uh, I guess they keyed us in on what was going on. It was very tough. My parents were bilingual. Jewish and uh, English, <laughs> and they spoke very well. They came over in late uh, late twenties. Uh, we had no difficulty with language problems. Okay, a quick question: Were either of you two gentlemen here at the school during the Second World War? <coughs> and if so, do you remember um, how the children contributed to the war effort at that time? I, <coughs> I do. I remember so vividly. I, I remember um, we were. In uh, I was here up until 1940, and then I went to high school, of course, but um, uh, the, the wrapping paper for cigarettes was foil. Cigarettes, whatever, they came in the package, they were wrapped in foil. We were encouraged to pick up and scrounge all the foil we could find in order to be able to melt it and form it into large balls and in order for it to be melted down to make aluminum for the use of the war effort. That stays in my mind forever. 
Mm. I don't think that I remember so <coughs> I think the girls, <coughs> this was for the British War <coughs> the girls used to knit, used to make scarves, and uh, different things of that nature. And uh, we used to go in manual training, and we used to make up mock-up models. I remember so vividly the Spitfire. That was a very common airplane. And we used to make small little models so they could use these models to give them to people uh, that were in that field uh, so they could recognize a certain particular type of airplane. We had great teachers, and it was, uh, it, it was not a big school then, and uh, it was very multicultural, and, um, and I was not a, a well-behaved kid, and in those days you, there was corporal punishment, so you got the strap if you misbehaved, and I'm sorry to say I got the strap six, six times, <laughs> starting in the first grade because I, I played with the globe of the world that was actually inflatable, so we played volleyball with it, we got caught, and that was the end of that, so a lot of my friends spoke didn't speak English at home. They spoke the language of their parents, who most of whom were immigrants. From what countries? Oh, well, Hong Kong, China, um, Italy, Portugal, Greece. Um, I mean, virtually any place you could mention, uh, there were kids who attended this school whose families came from countries all around the world. I was a good reader, so I was asked to help some immigrant students who for whom English was not their main language. And I remember sometimes I would be asked by the teacher to take a student and go into the hallway while the regular class was going on and we would read together so the student could learn how to read in English. The girls were always, I mean, not, all, not always, a lot of the girls would uh, had skipping rope. And they also had this game that was similar to skipping rope, but it was done with all these elastic bands that were connected to each other and they double, double, yeah, double sure skipping and whatever that was called and so on so uh, and the other thing was as my brother reminded me along one side of the school on the, on the uh, against the front, front wall uh, there was sort of a, almost a marketplace where you could go and there was you played marbles but it wasn't like the real game of marbles which is in a circle it was like somebody would take a shoe box and cut little holes in it and they would be small holes and medium-sized holes and bigger holes and if you got if you could throw an alley or a marble through the smallest hole, you might get ten marbles back. And if you got it through the middle, you might get five back. And if you did it through the easiest big hole, you'd get one or two back. And of course, every time you missed, the guy who was running the game got to keep your marbles. And that's what we did. That's, that was another very popular thing at recess. Uh, well, where the old um, kindergarten was, was a very large room. It was the biggest area in the, in the school where they would have assemblies and choirs would sing and so on and so forth. And uh, we had a dinner and uh, I don't think parents were invited actually. It was all students and uh, it was just for the sixth grade because we were leaving to go to another school for the seventh grade. Yeah, we have one tour. And we had a party. That's wonderful. And I remember uh, my best friend Jim Heinzman uh, and I sang a song on the stage. I borrowed my brother and my future brother-in-law's guitar and he sang, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley which means nothing to any of you, but you can go Google it and look it up. And that was the end of my time at North Street Public School. I just hung around with guys and uh, played marbles a lot. Played um, when wintertime came. We slid down the uh, sidewalk with uh, shoes and... What and types of recess activities did you... Or or the students like to play at the time? Well, so like marbles. Just to, you know, like, yeah. we, we, had, we had marbles. You know, like, mm -hmm. I was a marble aficionado. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, I owned the marbles in the school. Wow. I had a big <laughs> thousand marbles. That's all I can remember. How did you get your marbles? Gambling. Gambling. <laughs> oh, tell us more. Um, um, marbles. I mean, well, you, know, you know, you you flip you flip your your finger, you cock your finger in a particular way, and you um, met a crack or something, and you you scored points, and 
after a while, and we scored so many points. These are these are my marbles, and those are your marbles. You want to do it again, and and that's how we started. You know, the fondest of memories I have was upstairs when uh, I went to um, what 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 is it called it the health care center or something at health care center on this. Third floor, second floor, third floor. It was very nice. There was there was a health um, nurse upstairs and uh, looked after um, cuts and bruises and all that sort of stuff. And uh, the um, what was it six, grade five or six or six and seven or somewhere. And um, I spent two years there. And um, the um, everybody who who was up the, up on the second floor or third floor were they they were just good friends, you know. Along the street, no houses here. The candy store and uh, school supply store was on the other side of the street, directly opposite the gate there, right? So you can you know uh, you have your friends to keep keep track of the teacher you're able, you run across the store and get more more playing cards, you know, with bubble gum, you know, just in case you're losing or something. So, you, you know, I've got a scene around the corner there. We'll just run out to the store and come back. Yeah. No, I remember we used to have to use straight pens in grade three or so. Oh, yeah. So filling an ink well was a big deal for, you know, the teacher's pet, eh? Hey? Like, you know, you get to fill the ink wells. Wow. So, and from later grades, they did use the ink wells? No, like, uh, I think it only lasted until, like, uh, grade five. It, like, we, we didn't have pencil. We graduated from the thick pencils, you know, pretty <laughs> early. You know, so now we, we're into the ink and pen, and, you know, grade eight, we got ballpoint pens because they just been invented or something of that nature. Never were lucky for things to do. Yeah. You know, you know just sometimes you'd even climb the roofs of houses along Henry yeah, Street and jump right. from roof to roof, eh? That's right. You know, like, you know, like say, I'm, I'm going to go up and jump, climb up on the roof there, we're going to go down the block off the roof, eh? <laughs> like, that's going to go over real well. <laughs> that's right. Hey, Cat, Mum? Um, what comes to mind when you think of Ord? A very happy pleasant school. The, the staff was always great. We kept together for years and um, the children when I was there were predominantly Chinese. They were lovely children. And it was a pleasure being there. And one year I only had, in my class of 40 some odd, I only had two that spoke English. So we we had quite a time. So they came to the school without knowing any English. Oh yes. And on the other hand, I remember one little boy who uh, translated from English into Chinese for his parents when the parents came. Oh. Parents, uh, he could speak English, but they couldn't. But the parents were very angry, ang anxious for the children to learn English. And one little girl confided into me. I said, now tell me the Chinese for, I forget what word I used. And she said, I'm not allowed to speak Chinese in school. Her parents, you see, were so anxious that they learn English that they didn't uh, speak mm -hmm. Chinese. One of my funny stories, would you like to hear it? Yes, yes please. Well. There was one little, one little boy who was innocent himself, but I noticed they would sit cross-legged, and I noticed every once in a while his foot would shoot out and he would kick the little child next to him. <laughs> so uh, I saw this one time, and, and I started berating the, the little boy. And the child who had been kicked grabbed my skirt and gave it a pull, and he looked up very seriously and said, Never mind, Miss Emerson, 
I'll get them on the way home and kick them in the ass. <laughs> what other special days did you have in the school year? Do you remember? Special days? Yeah, like... Well, speak. We had Armistice Day or Remembrance Day. And um, I felt very strongly about that because many of my friends were in the war. Some didn't come back. So. What are some of the first things that come to mind when you think of war? Um, I think about some of the great friendships I made here. And some of the great times I had in the playground outside. Um, some fantastic games of soccer. Um, hockey sticks were not allowed. So we did the next best thing, played soccer. Um, so that, that was definitely a memorable event, uh, or memorable times here. The grade six trips were also the highlight of your Horde Street career. You would go to Boyne River for a week, that's a natural uh, science school, and a trip to Ottawa, and those both happened in your grade six year. And from grade three on up, that's what you looked forward to. It was, um, it was predominantly Chinese when I was here. Um, if you look back at some of the school photos, the class photos from the 70s, you would see majority Chinese kids like me um, and the odd non-Chinese kid, but I'd say the majority of the school uh, was Chinese. I think we were very, we were one of the first groups in the TDSB to pilot the Heritage Language Program. Um, so I my parents signed me up to learn Cantonese as part of the school day. Um, and I think we did about half an hour a day, uh, but it was built into our regular school. So I think that was something that I, I grew up with. So like right now, we have a Mandarin program? Oh, do you? Yeah. yeah. Well, fantastic. I think um, I was one of the kids that started that program way back when. So when it was a predominantly Chinese community right. here, what, did most of the kids in the playground speak English or Cantonese, or was it a mixture? Oh, it was it was it was predominantly English. Predominantly yes, English for uh, the kids. I think we were the first generation of uh, uh, Canadian-born uh, mm -hmm. Chinese kids. Right. So our goal was to, you know, we wanted to be Dale Sibley. We wanted to be, you know, uh, like all the other Canadian kids. So we. Learn, learn English in, in most cases was our first language here. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Chinese is what you spoke at home, but the minute you left the house, um, you spoke English. Right? So in the schoolyard, I'd say there was, uh, so all the kids that were born here, um, we all spoke English. You always had this influx of uh, new kids, uh, new immigrants uh, to Canada, and they were in the ESL classes. But, um, and they would, you know, we try, try to bring them along as much as we could. Um, but yeah, we mainly spoke English. Did you appreciate the classes in Cantonese that were held at the school? At the Did time, the no. no. At the time, it was the worst thing ever because I, <laughs> I didn't want it. I didn't want to learn Chinese. Um, in retrospect, you know, I've learned some things that I never would have learned. Right? Sports was big. Were there sports teams? Sports teams, volleyball, and track were the two big things at the school. Um, the team, from what I remember. Um, Volleyball teams did very well uh, back in the day. We didn't have basketball, um, but we had track. So volleyball was in the, in the fall, and track was in the spring. Um, those were the major sports we had. The track meet was at Central Tech. Um, that was the big track meet for all the area. But I remember practicing in the school year. We would do the dash, long jump, broad jump. The long distance ones, we'd run around the block. So the 400, 800 meter, we would run around the block, and, and the teachers would time us. Um, relays, same thing. And the odd time we go down to Grange Park and do our 400 meter um, runs there. Um, but the big track meet was the big thing that we practiced for, and that was a full day at Central Tech um, and on their track. So, um, did, did you personally do well on those type of teams? I did very well. <laughs> the volleyball teams. You know what? What I what I do want to share with you guys. I learned to play volleyball here, and because it was so popular. Partly because it was the only team sport that was at the school, everybody played it. Everybody in the neighborhood played it. We practiced, you know, in um, when we were away from school, we practiced in the schoolyard. Um, I played all through um, junior school, high school, intramural university. Uh, I still play now uh, in an uh, adult league. Um, so I really learned to, to love the game um, starting here. When I when I first started teaching. Uh, 
98% of all the students going to Ord were Chinese. Very few non-Chinese non kids here. A, a few black kids and a few white children. And, uh, but the classes were relatively big. I, uh, I have 36 children in my class. When I, when I first started teaching, that was in the 60s, and, and you, had, you had readers and you had uh, reading uh, manuals, for the, manuals for the teachers, and there was a, um, a, a teacher's, uh, no, a, a, a student's workbook and math, and the rest of it, this was in the 60s where you could teach anything you wanted. They said, you know, if, if, if a child came into school with a, a kitten, you'd base all your lessons, your math, your reading, your social studies, your science on this kitten. Other than reading and, and, uh, and math, there was no curriculum. And then when I was leaving Ord, there was a huge, huge, huge fat curriculum book, and they kept changing. Every year they changed the curriculum, add more stuff to it. And I was, at, the, at that time I was teaching grade one. About yeah, um, uh, as I said, starting off, it was uh, mostly Chinese, and then and then more blacks, and um, and then what happened was people were uh, doctors were coming to to work at the hospitals on exchange, so I had a child from Kuwait, and children from Israel, um, all different national then all different nationalities. And, and uh, new Canadians from Hong Kong, and then as time went on, new Canadians from China who spoke, some spoke Mandarin and uh, others spoke dialects from little villages and hadn't been, the kids hadn't been to school, so yes, big changes. Basically, basically, it, when I first started off, uh, they, were speak, they were from Hong Kong, they had gone to school in Hong Kong, which a lot of the children from China hadn't. Mm -hmm. And they were speaking Cantonese, mm -hmm. and and when I was hired, I was not hired by a principal. I was hired by the Toronto Board of Education. So it was a coincidence that I was sent here with so many Chinese children, because my mother was brought up in Shanghai, and she knew Cantonese, and so I started to learn some Cantonese so I could, you know, uh, speak to the children. And but when they when the children from China came, the spelling of the names were all very different. Like I knew how to phonetically spell the names in Cantonese, but not um, not the Mandarin names. Do you miss teaching? At times, and I still have teaching dreams. I had one. I had one uh, at the end of last week. It's June, and have I taught any reading? <laughs> <laughs> what do you miss most about teaching? I miss. I miss, the, I miss the children. I miss the excitement when you're teaching something new and you can see the delight in the children's faces or whatever. And um, one of the things I did in grade, when I was teaching grade one, um, this was kind of a bribe type thing. You finish your work and you're well behaved. You can, you can play, you can play scientist. And I had two, two of these tables, children's tables set up at the front of the room, and and I would um, and there were there were chemicals in there, and the children would the children uh, would put on a lab coat, which was a, a green garbage bag, so they didn't spill stuff on themselves, and uh, and they loved doing that. They read the rules, and one of the rules was don't eat don't eat the don't taste the chemicals, but they that was a big thing for them. They wanted to try these experiments. And, I, and they were so excited. I, find, I found it hard to keep up with the children. I'm getting science books from the library and sitting in my bed looking up experiments that the children could do and they want immediate results. And um, yeah, and I, I was amazed when I, when I was teaching grade one, I was amazed that the kids come in, um, they, a lot of them don't, can't even recognize all the, the letters of the alphabet in random order. And by the end of the year, the average child could read scholastic books. Do you know what scholastic books are? Yeah. I, had, I, I, every, every time there was a, 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 those flyer things that were sent 
for me to give to the kids. I kept one, ordered Scholastic books. I had bins and bins and bins of Scholastic books. Put them out at the, at, at the end of the year, put them out on the carpet, go and choose a book and sit and read. Also, uh, I was just amazed at the, the children's writing. They could, they could do pretend writing when they started in my class, and then most of the children could, could write full pages. I was relatively young when I started teaching, and other teachers coming in were young too, and, it's like we, and we socialized together. And that was lots of fun. Um, many of these teachers I'm still in touch with. And four times a year we have lunch together. And uh, I'm, I'm in touch with, um, it could be at least 10 of my former students. And so that is, that's very special to me. What were the big things that you liked about the school? Well, I guess as a kid, you don't think about those things, but looking back, making uh, lifelong friends, people I still talk to to this day. I lived in the East End. Well, so would you come to school by yourself, take anything? Yeah. TTC, I grew up on the streetcar and subway. So your parents never, like, do you remember your parents? We, well, they drove me from JK to grade 2, and then after that, grade 3, grade 6, I was on my own. Huh. I am very grateful that I was read to as a child. Um, at least three teachers, Mr. Turner, Mrs. Pierre, and Ms. Necto, they all read to me and to this day I still read so they planted a good seed. What are some of the first things that come to mind when you think of Ward? Oh my goodness, uh, some things that come to mind. Well, I've always thought of Ord as a very special place. Mm. Um, I've, I think of Ord as um, a, a, a unique place, in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. It was my first school as principal, so it was even more special to me than, than just uh, another mm -hmm. school. But what, what come to mind is uh, the students. We had a very multicultural population, and the kids were really great. They were just wonderful kids, and, and I loved them all. Yeah. Um, we had also some very, very, very good teachers. I shouldn't say some. We had a, a lot. As a matter of fact, all were very good teachers. And some of them were very special teachers uh, that, that I have stayed lifelong friends with. I think the team, what, yeah. we, what we looked at as, as the team, were not only the teachers. They were the teachers, and then they were the educational assistants yeah. that were really great. And you know, often not working as educational assistants, but you know, you could uh, leave a class with them, and and they would do really well. Um, and we had uh, the daycare, and they were part of the team. I think the daycare is still yeah. here, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also the caretaking staff, the office staff. So I think. It was a team that worked really well together. You know, one of the things that we did was we, we kind of drew up a code of behavior for kids. Um, and a code of behavior for us adults as well in the school, right? So it was like a, a, an all-school code of behavior. And the uh, underlying principle for that code of behavior is that we needed to treat everybody with respect. So we expected the kids to treat each other with respect. We expected the kids to treat teachers with respect. But we also expected the teachers to treat kids with respect. So I think what happens is when there is a conflict, uh, that means somebody is not treating somebody with respect, right? And they have to answer for their actions. So I think the teachers would hold, if it was a student, the teachers would hold the, the, that student responsible for not acting according to the code of behavior. And I think it was important that the parents also knew the code of behavior so that they could encourage their, their uh, children at home to act properly in the school.
We, what we thought when I came to Ord, what we thought it would be good is that every student had an opportunity to learn a language. Because we know from studies that were done uh, in England and in Australia and in Toronto by uh, a researcher uh, called Jim Cummins, we know, at, he was doing research at OISE, we know that it's very good um, cognitively for kids to, to learn a la another language. So it's very good for them to develop their cognitive skills or, you know, their smarts mm -hmm. if, if they either had another language or could learn another language. It was good for their education. So at ORD, we decided that every child should learn a language. And we said, you know what, this concurrent program, we really don't need it. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a letter to the parents and saying, in September, I came to Ord, um, gee, when did I come to Ord? Um, hmm, maybe in March. I'm, you know what, I'm not even sure. So such a long time ago, it was 30 years ago. So, but I remember in the September, the first September, I wrote a letter to the parents and I said, um, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of uh, good uh, scientific research that, that in fact it's good for kids to, or educational research, that it's good for kids to learn a language. And we're going to introduce uh, so that a, a, her a heritage language program so that all the kids can learn the language. So we introduce Spanish and Chinese. So anybody that wanted to learn, they could choose either Chinese or Spanish. The Chinese New Year was always very, very big. We had uh, a, a literal production of the Chinese New Year. We also had um, an event. Uh, it was a, a fundraising event, but it was like a, a fun fair that the parents and the, the kids were always, the, the, it was the whole day. We had activities in the yard and um, food, parents would bring food and it was, it was, Miss, Mrs. Mann was always involved in it. It was always, I can't re I think we called it a fun fair. Mm. Yeah, uh, and of course the Christmas concert. We had a Christmas concert that was always very memorable and uh, we, celebrated Black History Month because I, I forgot to tell you in addition because more and more black children were were coming to Ord so in addition to us having the uh, Chinese program and the uh, Spanish program we interwove a black heritage program uh, into the classroom so that the teacher whose name was Veronica Sullivan who was absolutely magnificent and marvelous teacher. She would go into the classroom uh, and the teacher would stay in the classroom and they would do uh, the, the program together. Lunar New Year festivals yes. were big events and at one time Ogden and the Ord shared the, their lunar celebration. And one year it would be at Ogden and one year it would be at Ord. Um, but eventually that, that died out and we just had our own. So that, that was really one of the biggest events at the school. That everybody loved it. I think it was a very colourful event. Was that held on a school day or on a weekend? Um, no, it was... Um, the the um, concert was usually after school in, the, in an evening event during the week. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, would, it was fun. There'd be Chinese dancing and there'd be the dragon dance and um, all the choirs, um, the English choir, the French choir, the, the Chinese choir. Um, <laughs> right. We, we used to have um, a, a black heritage teacher who did, well, she was an artist and she was very good at storytelling, fantastic at storytelling. and. She would um, she would make little plays for the children, and I don't know how she did it, but she used to read stories, and she would sort of tell the story as the children acted, and if 
if they could um, if they could talk clearly and and wanted to talk, then they could have a little, they could um, say some of the conversation themselves. But she managed to make it as if every child was acting, and yet she told the story. I I, I can't quite explain it, but it was fantastic. It gave the kids a great sense of accomplishment, and she used a lot of um, African stor um, stories. Folk stories. So all um, the children in the school participated in that program? Everyone from the, from kindergarten up to, well I don't know the kindergarten did. And yes I think she went to kindergarten to all the kin, from kindergarten right up to the end of grade six and all the special programs. What, what was her name? Veronica Sullivan. The new year was a really big deal here and we used to have the Mandarin teachers and they would start making decorations to decorate the school. Months and months ahead, they had all their kids working on these decorations and just a few weeks before, a few weeks before the, uh, the actual Lunar New Year would come, they would decorate the foyer and the night of the concert, well, all the hallways were decorated everywhere. It was just so colorful. And then we had, as one of the uh, extracurricular activities, or perhaps it was the concurrent, we had children that learned how to do the lion dance. And so as part of the concert, we would have the lion dance with the big, you know, we had a big Chinese, do they still have the big Chinese drum that they pull out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so that's, that's what really came to mind. Before I came to Ord, I didn't really know very much about the Chinese community in Toronto at all. I had worked for years in the Italian community because I'm of Italian origin and speak Italian fluently. So I had really knew very little about the Chinese community other than Chinese food and a little bit of history. And so I was just so absolutely delighted with the colorful celebrations we had and the whole student population. I loved my time. And Mary Webb, when we had our Lunar, Lunar New Year um, celebrations, we had very, at, at, before Mrs. Vernon came, when Miriam was here, we had a really active parent community. And we would have Lunar New Year lunch with food that was donated by all the Chinese restaurants in the neighborhood and uh, and then we would buy tickets. This was to raise money for the New Year for all the decorations and everything that costs money, right? And we had a very active parent community that would go and they would get all these donations from all these restaurants and then they would run this humongous lunch. Everybody stuffing their face with Chinese food and, um, and so it was just a, you know, a really, really active, energetic vibe and, and so I remember that period of time we had a really active parents council and the parent community was very involved. And then uh, later on, it wasn't quite quite as active, but we always had a really active parent council here, mm -hmm. right, with interested parents. And I really enjoyed my parents. Like I said, I didn't know very much about um, the Chinese community in Toronto, and it was through interacting with them at this school and um, through the parent meeting the parents one on one. Uh, as parents of the students that I was teaching, that I really got to love the Chinese community. I learned how to play the big drum. I actually played it at one of the, I think uh, there were no drummers, and we weren't going to have the lion dance one year, and we said, oh no, we can't have that. And I got Miss Colatash there, learned how to play the cymbals, <laughs> and I got somebody to teach me how to play the big drum, and so for the lion dance, I played the drum, and Miss Colatash played the cymbals, and we got it, we had it happen. Wow. So, um, yeah, and then I ended up, I became so interested that I was hired by the school board for a number of summers to write um, units for the social studies program. And so one of them that I was writing was Early Civilizations, and I chose China. And I wrote with a Chinese woman that worked for the school board. We wrote the, the unit for um, Early China uh, for the school board to pilot, which later became a textbook. And, um, and so that, that was because of my love for the Chinese community here that I really wanted to, to learn a lot more about it. Yeah. And, uh, so I was really interested in the arts and so I concentrated on that. One year we put on a Shakespearean play. I had a wonderful class that year who was very, very good. 
And uh, so I'm very interested in Shakespeare, and I found a one-hour version of The Tempest. And Scala Tash and I practiced these kids, and they learned the Shakespearean language. And uh, we watched the play, and we studied the play, and we put it on. We had different children, like, because some of the, the memorization was very long, we might have two or three kids playing a character. But you would know it was the same character because they wore the same costume. It was an hour long. It was fabulous. Just so what was the makeup of the student population when you were here? Uh, we had um, everything. I would say uh, maybe a, a third, maybe a little more than a third, about a third Chinese, mm -hmm. or let's say Oriental, about a third white, and about a third that was a mixture of other things. And it was wonderful. We had doctors who flew in from all over the world and would reside at the hospital because they were doing um, some special uh, courses or special learning anyway in maybe some major surgery or something and their kids would end up coming here. So we had kids from New Zealand and from Australia, uh, England, from uh, many parts of Africa and so the kids would come here and I got to learn, I got invites from all over the world. I didn't take them. But it was very nice that uh, people, uh, they loved the school. Oh my gosh, it's true. There, there is nothing like it. My school that I go to, much as there is warmth, and I love my students. I, I chose well. Uh, there's nothing like Ord. We had, we did a lot of the, the, the focus on the cultures. So we did some lion dancing. Uh, we had the, the Chinese teachers doing different things from the Chinese culture. We had a black heritage uh, program here, and we also had a Spanish heritage. So all the heritage programs did something. All the classes did something. And, and, and some concerts were bigger than others. Those were the really big ones. The black heritage program was ran by a teacher, Veronica Sullivan. She's now teaching, I believe she's teaching at the, the black um, um, elementary school that is uh, North Toronto. Uh, or north of Toronto. Um, she's teaching there, but she ended up leave, leaving here and she was teaching at Chalk Farm, but she was here for years. I came here, I met her, I saw the program, fell in love with the program. The teachers here, again, all of that, that togetherness, they were so encouraging with the program because they saw what it did for the kids. And so the kids learned um, so many different things, um, you know, and they would always have a presentation of some kind and mostly through the arts. To, to, to showcase what they had learned that whole, uh, mm -hmm. that whole um, season, whether it was um, uh, for the spring concert or whether it's something special that they were doing. But yeah, and the kids were so, their hearts were in it. You would see them and it would bring tears mm -hmm. in your eyes. Mm -hmm. They were so wonderful. The, the things that they could do, whether it was a dance or everything was just perfect and they, learn about the African culture, um, even fabrics and making sure it was the real fabric and um, the costumes had to be authentic when they were going on stage. It was, it was beautiful. So I jumped in and I wanted to help everywhere. Wow. We became a family and we just really cared so much for each other. Um, and the parents were the same way. Um, so once you're here and you're doing for the kids, you became special to everything and everybody, and they in turn uh, was the same for you. Uh, I love the kids. The kids, uh, they had a drive. Um, they were going places and I was so proud of them. Um, it didn't matter what the background, everybody would talk, they were going to university, they were so inspired. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that was the thing I noticed with the school, so it inspired all of us. Not only the students, but the, the, the teachers, and the whole staff, the caretaker, it was one big family.